Hi, my name is Wendell Lim. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Today I'd like to tell you about using synthetic biology to build cell signaling networks. One of the most amazing things about living systems is that they are able to monitor their environment and make complex decisions. An example is shown here. This is a uh, classic film of a human neutrophil, a white blood cell, and you can see it's able to detect and chase that small little black dot, which is a bacteria. So somehow it's detecting signals given off by that bacteria, and it's using it to coordinate its entire uh, cytoskeleton to give you this coordinated movement and eventually the phagocytosis of that bacterium. And so what we're interested in is trying to understand how is it that cells like this are able to read in many environmental inputs and then make these complex decisions about what they're going to do. What's particularly interesting for us is the idea that um, these decisions that cells make are coordinated by networks uh, made of molecules. And so we're interested in trying to understand how is it that a system of molecules can actually work together to make these sorts of complex decisions. In addition, cells show many, many different types of responses to their environment. And so how is it that so many different regulatory behaviors and signaling behaviors have been able to evolve? How is evolution use this to get the kinds of diverse cellular behaviors that we see? Traditionally, the way that uh, the field of biology has, has attacked these sorts of problems is to take an interesting system like a cell that does something interesting and then try to dissect it. That is, using things like a microscope or other tools to observe, describe, and classify what's going on. This could be using a microscope to look at the structures that you see in the cell, using genetics or genomics to look at the, uh, the DNA sequences that are, and genes that are involved in a process, or structural methods to look at the structures of these molecules, and network methods to look at how they're arranged in, in networks as shown down here. Um, but one of the problems that we have in today's post-genomic era, era of biology is the fact that these approaches really help us to take a complex system and take it apart. So that's essentially like taking something like a radio and then disassembling it. And what results is that we, we now find that we often have a really detailed and complete molecular parts list. But what we lack is we still have a relatively poor understanding of how one can assemble these sorts of parts into functional systems. And so one of the things that, that we're interested in is trying to complement traditional approaches of taking complex systems and breaking them down into their molecular parts, um, the, the, the traditional deconstructionist approach of biology, with uh, what we consider a synthetic biology approach. That is the idea of using, um, uh, trying to understand how simpler molecular parts can be assembled uh, and synthesized to create more complex systems. This is a lot like how an engineer, for example, thinks about how to use simple electronic parts to put them together to assemble devices and systems like a computer. Or, or they can put them together in different ways to make other kinds of devices with different behaviors. So really, um, this is an, uh, an approach that really is inspired by, by engineering, but really is what we think goes on during the course of evolution, where pre-existing molecular parts are put together in different ways that might generate new behaviors. And uh, the, the goal here is that perhaps trying to understand this complementary synthetic approach of how biological systems are put together can help us not just understand the details of any one system, but really more about the logic and rules about how, in general, uh, cellular systems are constructed. Really, this is about asking the inverse question. Rather than trying to take apart a cell, we're really trying to ask, can we view cells, for example, as complex devices or robots uh, that execute new decision-making behaviors, and can we learn how to program them, much like this pro robot here, which was programmed to actually look for and search for red balls in, in a field of, of other blue balls. Okay. So, what we're interested in is trying to build and rewire new cellular responses. Why do we want to do this? First of all, we really feel that um, we can learn by building, that by tinkering with these systems and putting them together in different ways and in systematic ways, we can reach a deeper understanding of the molecular logic of how cell signaling systems are put together.
The second thing is that if we really understand these rules and these principles of how evolution has used molecular parts to build new kinds of cellular responses and behaviors, then maybe we can actually apply this to build designer cells that have new customized behaviors. This includes the idea that maybe we could build cells that carry out very sophisticated therapeutic actions, like being able to seek out and kill cancer cells. More broadly, this really represents kind of a, a new way of trying to think about biology. Mostly, in, historically, biology is focused on trying to study the biological systems that exist. And in a way, synthetic biology has given us the capability of not just studying what exists, but making different variants of these and asking what can exist or what cannot exist, and trying to understand the, the boundaries between these. Um, even though this area of, of sort of synthetic systems, biological-like systems, may seem uh, like they're not truly biological, what I would argue is that these systems still have to obey the same molecular uh, and physical laws as evolved systems. Uh, and so really trying to understand uh, the, the entirety of these really can perhaps help us understand those principles better. And in addition, uh, it, it might very well be that uh, within this sphere of what can exist, uh, there may be uh, cells that show very useful behaviors that we could harness. So how do we go about trying to rewire uh, cellular signaling systems? And one of the key principles that I want to raise here is the principle of modularity. So back in the, uh, the 80s and 90s, when we were really starting to sequence all of these genomes, one of the really striking findings was that many signaling proteins were built from simpler parts. That is, if you looked at a lot of the, the, the molecules involved in signaling, we found that they had a lot of uh, modular domains that were easily identifiable by sequence. And moreover, that many of these domains were found repeated in different proteins and in different combinations. Uh, these domains really uh, come in two flavors, which I'll talk about in a second in more detail. But one is uh, catalytic domains, things like kinases that carry out catalytic informations and post-translational modifications like phosphorylation. Uh, as well as interaction domains that are involved in binding and recognition. But the basic hypothesis that emerged at this time was that perhaps nature has evolved complex re regulatory circuits um, by using these modules as kind of a toolkit to put together different types of devices. So let me tell you about the different types of domains that we see. As I said, one class are catalytic uh, modules that really are involved in directly transmitting information. So a, a, a good example of this are the, the enzymes that are involved in phosphorylation, kinases and phosphatases, for example. So kinases will put on a phosphate onto a target protein, the protein shown in green here, uh, and that phosphate might change the conformation or the activity of that protein, leading to some sort of downstream effect. Now, that phosphate can be taken off by a corresponding complementary eraser catalytic function, in this case, a phosphatase. Now, in addition to this kind of writer and eraser uh, catalytic activity, oftentimes uh, there will also be reader domains that can recognize and bind to, say, the phosphorylated moiety. Okay? So you have this ensemble of readers, erasers, and, uh, uh, writers, and erasers. Another example of that that's exactly parallel are um, the enzymes that regulate uh, GTPases. So GTPases can exist in two forms, the GDP-bound state and then the GTP-bound state, which is usually the active one. The transitions between these states are mediated by another set of, uh, of writer and eraser catalytic activities. GEFs or guanine nucleotide exchange factors lead to the putting on GTP and activating the GTPase protein, uh, whereas GAP proteins or GTPase activating proteins lead to the hydrolysis of GTP and turning off of the system. And once again, there are also oftentimes reader domains that can recognize the, the specific activated form of the GTP. So these sorts of writer and eraser uh, uh, enzymes are often put together. You can get cascades or other network linkages where, for example, one phosphorylation event will activate another enzyme, and that will in turn activate another enzyme, leading to the sorts of uh, networks that, and circuits that we see in cells. Now, uh, the second important class of modules that we see in signaling domains, in signaling proteins, are interaction modules that really play a more crucial role in directing and controlling the flow of information. So these catalytic domains that I talked about are often combined with 
uh, recognition domains. Many of them are protein interaction domains, uh, like this SH3 domain that recognizes a cognate uh, linear peptide motif, in this case a proline-rich peptide. Uh, there are many other sorts of domains that recognize different distinct types of linear motifs. In addition, there are also recognition or interaction domains that bind to specific lipid species at the plasma membrane. So uh, these are combined with the catalytic domains to control where these catalytic domains go and who they interact with. So how is it that catalytic and interaction domains can be put together to yield the diverse circuitry that we see? So there, this slide uh, shows two very simple but very prevalent uh, mechanisms uh, by which these domains can be put together to give you complex circuits. One is really based on the simple principle of recruitment and assembly, that the cell is full of these different types of catalytic mod, uh, mo modules, um, and really a, a key question is how do they efficiently interact with the right ones? And so what you'll find is often, let's say protein X is a kinase and Y is its substrate, then that, that uh, they might have a modular interaction domain and recognition ligand uh, fused to these partners, which allows uh, uh, protein X to specifically interact with and, and modify protein Y. The importance of these sorts of recruitment and assembly interactions uh, is really uh, exemplified at the extreme by a class of proteins known as scaffold proteins. These are proteins that have multiple interaction domains and they often can bind to multiple signaling proteins like these shown here, X, Y, and Z. They really help to coordinate uh, a set of catalytic components to be at the right place and the right time, allowing them to interact in a very specific uh, cascade. A second way that these modules can be used to uh, lead to interesting behavior is the construction of allosteric signaling switches using modular autoinhibition. That oftentimes you'll find a catalytic domain, say like a kinase, that has other interaction domains within it. But oftentimes in the basal state, these interaction domains will actually autoinhibit or interact with the catalytic domain itself or with other parts of, of the protein. And that can lead to uh, inhibition, either through directly sterically blocking the, uh, the active site of, the, of the, the catalytic function, or by conformationally contorting it so that it's inactive. And if you get this sort of situation, then oftentimes there are cases where uh, a competing ligand that disrupts this uh, auto-inhibitory interaction can then result in the allosteric activation of that catalytic function, in this case, for example, activation of a kinase. So we see these sorts of uh, mechanisms over and over again in many different signaling proteins with different types of catalytic and interaction domains. And it really lends itself to the plausibility that these modules and motifs really might uh, form a, a toolkit or a set of building blocks uh, or a cellular uh, language that we can use to create new uh, functions. And that evolution seems to have used this. We see this by the different combinations of domains that we see in evolved proteins. But also, another piece of evidence comes from disease. So in diseases like cancer or in viral or other pathogenic diseases, there's a lot of evidence that these sorts of modules have been hijacked and used to redirect catalytic functions to new uh, uh, targets and other things like that. And it's, in other words, really generating new signaling behaviors that actually are associated with a pathology or a disease. So a corollary of this is that if this is really true, then, then it argues that we should be able to use these modular words to say new things, that perhaps we can actually use them to engineer cells in a somewhat systematic and logical way. Uh, so if we can do this, what is it that we want to say, and how do we say it? So about 10 years ago, my group started to try to explore this question and ask, really, could we start building new types of signaling proteins as well as signaling networks and cellular behaviors? Uh, so one of the, the first things that we did was to actually tr ask, could we build synthetic signaling switch proteins? And what we took is a, a, a group of different catalytic functions and then a group of uh, different interaction domains and then made uh, random combinatorial libraries in which we combined interaction domains with catalytic domains, as well as the intramolecular ligands of these domains, with the idea that we wanted to find out, would any of these show inhibition and in, in a way that would allow them to now, uh, if we added competing ligands, become activated, and would they show interesting uh, behaviors, regulatory behaviors, like natural signaling switch switches? 
And in fact, what we found is that when we did this, uh, a fairly large proportion, probably about 30% of them, actually showed some form of auto inhibition and regulation. And moreover, when we looked at these in detail and looked at how the types of behaviors of integration between multiple inputs, we saw a lot of different types of Boolean behaviors. Uh, really, we saw the diversity that mimicked uh, the types of regulation that we actually see in natural signaling proteins, arguing we think that this, is, this kind of domain shuffling really forms a way to get an evolutionary starting point for building new types of signaling switches. Another example of, of looking at the modularity of signaling proteins comes from looking at um, signaling behaviors in the model cell system of yeast. So yeast is a single-celled organism that has to uh, make many decisions based on what uh, is in its environment. So one of the things that yeast do is they actually have two cell types and they can mate with each other, but to induce that mating response they have to detect a pheromone that comes from the other, their partner. And so there's a pathway called the mating response that actually detects a uh, mating pheromone, uh, this pathway th shown in red, and then that leads to the activation of a set of mating response genes. Now a completely different pathway that um, yeast have is uh, a pathway that deals with hyperosmotic stress. So if you put yeast into a high salt environment, it detects that, that, that change and then expresses a bunch of genes that, that help protect it against that osmolarity. So although though these pathways are completely different, what is, does link them is that they're both mediated by a set of kinases known as MAP kinases. The problem is that the cell is filled with many different types of kinases and quite a few of these MAP kinases uh, that are very closely related. And so the question is, uh, if these two pathways, which are physiologically distinct, use shared or similar components, how is it that they actually pass the information, transmit it in the right way, and you don't get kind of crosstalk so you get the wrong response? And so one of the things that was discovered uh, around this time was that there existed these scaffold proteins. For example, there's a scaffold protein that has multiple interaction domains that binds to the mating uh, receptor as well as the set of kinases that are involved in the mating response. They essentially act almost as a breadboard to wire together this circuit so that you get specific transmission of information from the mating uh, receptor to the uh, mating genes. Correspondingly, uh, there's also a scaffold protein associated with the osmo osmotic response pathway, which again binds to, to that receptor and then also assembles a distinct set of kinases that are involved in, in transmitting the information to the osmoresponse genes. So in other words, both of these pathways can coexist and be specific because there is a, a scaffold protein that, that essentially wires them together uh, in a specific way. And so one of the hypotheses that came from this uh, was that perhaps then evolution can create new pathways and w by wiring kinases and other catalytic functions together in different ways by generating new uh, chimeric scaffold proteins. So Sanghyun Park, a postdoc in the lab at the time, decided to try to test this by asking could we make a chimeric scaffold protein uh, that would assemble different kinases in these two distinct pathways. And what he found is that when he did this and made the right sort of combination of pathways, of components, he was able actually to make a scaffold that would, when put into a living cell, would now cause the cell to induce the osmolarity response when the cell was stimulated by the mating pheromone. So we could actually create a new input-output pathway, really mimicking evolution. In this case, we had a pathway where the cells would only survive on high osmotic stress when we actually stimulated them with uh, mating pheromones. So really supporting the idea that, that uh, without changing actually the catalytic components and really only changing the factors that were assembling them, we could create new types of input-output wiring and behavior in the cell. Here's another example of, of rewiring that we've been able to do. So um, Anselm Levskaya uh, recognized that in, in plants there are these really interesting protein interaction domains that, uh, where the interaction is regulated by light. So if you shine a certain wavelength of light, 750 nanometers, on this protein, it will change conformations and now tightly bind to its partner. Uh, and so uh, what we realized is that, again, many uh, signaling behaviors in mammalian cells are controlled by induced recruitment. So we asked, could we actually replace many of those interactions? Oftentimes the catalytic domain will be recruited to an activated receptor, but could we replace that receptor now with this light responsive protein from plants and recruit uh, catalytic domains, for example, this GEF, uh, 
to the uh, plasma membrane where it could act on its target uh, GTPase and lead to signaling output? Could we actually control the cell now with light? And so this is an example of linking uh, this, this light-activated uh, protein to uh, a RAC GEF. So that's going to activate the, uh, the protein, the RAC GTPase, which itself activates actin polymerization. As you see here, what happens is that when we shine the light now on, uh, which is the red circle, on the cell, you see recruitment of that RAC GEF and actually protrusion of the cell at that point. So we can actually make the cell uh, follow the light by, by putting in this novel uh, chimeric protein that combines uh, light-controlled uh, protein interaction with this catalytic activity. So what these experiments hopefully illustrate is that we really can use these sorts of signaling modules to, uh, to flexibly rewire and reprogram cellular signaling proteins as well as uh, the, ne the networks and to generate novel cellular behavior. So one of the things that we become more interested in is asking this second question about applications. Can we actually start harnessing this capability to rewire cells to, and put it to use? And one of the most exciting things for us is the idea of using this in, cell, in, in therapeutics and medicine. That mostly uh, today when we think about medicine uh, and, and therapeutics, we think about small molecules or biologics, which are very powerful and, and wonderful uh, agents. Uh, but one of the things that, that limits them is that they largely will, if you put them into the body, they act in a systemic way. And then also, they largely can just either block or activate something. And they can't actually make very complicated decisions. And that contrasts with, for example, a cell. So a cell of the immune system, for example, which also is essentially a therapeutic, it fights disease, is able to move through the body and find where there's a problem. So it can be spatially targeted. It can also integrate sources of information from that environment and make complex decisions. And it can also execute complex actions like this kind of migration or phagocytosis that we see with the, uh, the neutrophil. And so one of the, the visions that we have is if we really understood these principles of how we can rewire uh, cell signaling behaviors, then perhaps we could actually start to customize cells so that they can actually carry out uh, functions that are um, therapeutic. Uh, this would entail, for example, trying to change what sensors the cell has so that it can uh, detect either disease or user-provided inputs. Then we'd want to also be able to change the, uh, the, the cell signaling networks to control what's, how this information is processed and how decisions are made, and then link these to the many uh, interesting and powerful uh, payloads or actions that cells are capable of to really yield now what we consider a much smarter uh, uh, um, uh, therapeutic response. So um, <clears throat> one of the great places at test beds to really explore this today is in the area of adoptive immunotherapy. So immune cells, particularly uh, a type of immune cells known as T lymphocytes or T cells, are an ideal test bed for this kind of therapeutic engineering. These are cells that are, are able to, for example, recognize and kill a cell that's infected by a virus. So they have very powerful activities. More importantly, we know that we can actually remove T cells from a patient, we can genetically modify them ex vivo, we can expand them ex vivo, and then we can transfer them back into the patient. So this is pretty well established. Uh, and that, so, so we, can, we can do a lot of different things that, that don't have to do with trying to uh, modify things in situ. Uh, in addition, T cells can be used for many potential targets. They could be used to recognize cancer. They could be used to recognize chronic infection. And also, they could be used to combat autoimmunity. Okay. So how could we, for example, redirect T cells to recognize cancer? So if you look at a, a native T cell, the key receptor, a molecule that's used uh, to, to mediate its action, is the T cell receptor. So if you look closely at that, that has an extracellular domain and then key intracellular signaling motifs. And so, for example, when the cognate peptide uh, antigen is bound by that extracellular domain, it will lead to uh, phosphorylation of these intracellular motifs, which leads to the recruitment of various downstream signaling proteins that then, in turn, lead to the activation of that T cell and, for example, uh, killing of the target cell. What was shown in the uh, 80s by a number of people, including Zelig Eshar, was the idea that you could actually make 
synthetic or chimeric T cell receptors. So the idea here was, could you take an antibody that recognized a uh, antigen that was only expressed on the surface of a tumor cell? And then remarkably, they found that if they took this and then added the intracellular portion of the T cell receptor, that this would actually get activated when it recognized a cell with this antigen and lead to T cell activation. So you could actually make um, these kinds of synthetic receptors, in this case known as chimeric antigen receptors or CARs, that are built of, of different uh, extracellular recognition domains, things that recognize tumor antigens, but then uh, link together different sorts of signaling, intracellular signaling domains that control um, the activation of the T cell. And uh, now, 20 years later, uh, this process is refined somewhat, and they're really quite powerful uh, uh, versions of the chimeric antigen receptors that can recognize tumor antigens and stimulate T cell uh, activation. So these, we have these modular synthetic sensors that can recognize disease antigens and redirect T cell activity towards these cells. So the idea is that we could take these uh, CAR-modified T cells, put them back into the patient, and they should be able to move around the body and seek out those cells that have the cognate antigen and then kill them. So although, again, this seems like science fiction, what we now know in today's world over the last several years is that we actually can use this to attack certain B cell cancers. This has been remarkably successful in a number of studies shown here, uh, and uh, th that there have been uh, quite a few patients that have had a form of B cell cancer that is non-responsive to chemotherapy that have been cured uh, by using this sort of approach with, uh, with uh, modified engineered T cells. So this is tremendously exciting, um, but there are still problems with this, particularly uh, what we've shown is that we can take T cells, these powerful cells, and redirect them. But oftentimes there are many strong side effects because these cells are very strong in terms of their immune response. They secrete a lot of uh, uh, molecules called cytokines that really leads to a big uh, systemic uh, immune response. So although we can redirect them, right now oftentimes they're too strong or poorly controlled. So we really need to learn not only how to redirect this, this beast, but also how to tame the beast. And so this is where we have been trying to use synthetic biology to generate uh, engineered T cells that show much more controlled behavior. And so one example is the idea that could we actually make T cells that are remote controlled? T cells that um, only switch on when, for example, a physician provides a drug. We still want these cells to recognize the tumor cells, but we want this secondary switch to be layered over this that allows the user or the physician to control when and to what extent they're activated. And so Chia Wu, a postdoc in the lab, uh, has been doing studies at trying to build switchable uh, chimeric antigen receptors. So this is the uh, conventional chimeric antigen receptor that, of course, has an extracellular antibody that recognizes a tumor antigen and also has uh, these intracellular signaling motifs. What we decided to do was to ask, could we actually build a, a, an additional switch into this receptor by creating a split version of it? So could we take the recognition component, but then take off some of the key signaling modules and put those in a separate molecule, but then bring them together using modules that only heterodimerize when we add a, a drug, <clears throat> okay? So the uh, idea here is that the T cell would only get activated when it had this combination of both recognizing the cognate antigen as well as having the drug provided by the user. So fortunately, we've been able to construct a number of different versions of this uh, that work, and one of them is shown here. And so these are some actual assays based on these cells. So what's plotted here is um, T cell activation monitored by release of a cytokine called IL-2. And so what you see is when we look at the conventional CAR cells, uh, that uh, CAR T cells, that if we stimulate with the cognate antigen, which is shown in green, uh, that the cells get activated, and they actually don't care whether or not the drug is present or not, which is indicated by the orange square. In contrast, when we move to this on-switch CAR, T cells bearing this on-switch CAR, we see that they only get activated when there's a combination of both the cognate antigen in green as well as the drug in orange. So here is a case where the physician could actually control when the cell is activated as well as we've found the timing and the, the dosage or the, the potency of that response. What's shown here now is time-lapse microscopy of these 
uh, switchable CAR T cells attacking tumor cells. So what you see here uh, in the first movie is uh, the cells, the T cells are shown in color, and this is one recognizing uh, a cognate tumor cell with the correct antigen. But this is in the case without drug, uh, and so you see that they interact, but over the course of this 30-minute movie, uh, they don't actually kill that target cell. In contrast, when we now take the same cells and mix them with cancer cells and then add the drug, what we see is this, that we see the cells now engage with the target cells, uh, but then immediately you see this cell blebbing, and then this blue dye is indicative of the cell undergoing apoptosis. So that cell immediately start, starts dying, and once that cell is on its way to death, the cell, this T cell reorients, contacts this second cell, reorients its receptors to that, forming a different synapse, and then actually starts killing that. You see the blebbing as well as the uptake of the uh, blue dye. So within this 30-minute period where the, uh, um, in the absence of drug, the cell doesn't do anything, doesn't kill anything, uh, we see this that in the same time when the drug is added, they're able to potently uh, and serially kill uh, multiple target uh, cancer cells. Okay. So, um, we think this is tremendously exciting. We think that um, uh, in today's world, now that we have the capabilities of engineering and modifying cells, and we understand much more about the principles of how uh, signaling networks are put together, that we're on the verge of really uh, exciting uh, applications where we can uh, use this toolkit of modules to engineer different types of cells that can sense disease signals, environmental or niche signals in the body, as well as user signals, and integrate them to give you customized therapeutic action. And so uh, we think this is a really exciting period for applying synthetic biology to these sorts of uh, mammalian cells, to immune cells, to, to create uh, exciting and hopefully very useful therapeutic functions. And so that's the end of this lecture. I'd like to thank all of the people from my lab who did all of this work a very creative and inspiring group of people, as well as all of our collaborators and colleagues. And I'd like to thank you for watching this video.